test one, two. Shalom. Shalom, shalom. I want to say welcome in the name of Yeshua, Hamashiach, Jesus the Messiah. So we are blessed to be with you and have our all, all of you with us tonight. So tonight's a, a special night. Actually, sundown was about an hour ago, but that's okay. <laughs> But we're on Jewish time. We're, we always start on Jewish time, which means, you know, if there's, they always say if there's, there's three Jews, there's four opinions. So, <laughs> so anyway, we're, we're blessed to be with you, and we're going to just have, this is a family time. Hanukkah is a family time. So really, all of you are part of our mishpuka, our family. And so we're grateful to God for all of you. I'm Bruce Underwood. This is my dear wife of 40 plus your 42 years. <laughs> and she, she always says if we make it, it'll be 43 next year. <laughs> so, welcome. We have many friends and family here with us tonight. And really all of you are part of our family and you're in our hearts and we are grateful for God's presence in your life. And we just pray that this time tonight would be full of the Ruha Kanadesh, the Holy Spirit, and God the Father, God the Son, and everything about that. So tonight's night is special. So we are Shema Israel. We call ourselves Hear, O Israel. And to begin, what I want to do is have uh, Rochelle, we're going to have the shofar. That's the welcoming. And so um, if any of you know how to play the shofar, um, come on down. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so... This is going to be a, just a fun night, so we're going to have Rochelle. All I can do is make a joyful noise. Right, that, that, that's good. introduce a, a few people. Rochelle Pearl is a longtime friend. Her parents started Hebrew Christian Witness in 1955 in San Bernardino. And Janet and I, have, we've been friends for more than 30 years with Rochelle. And it's going to be a real treat tonight. She's a true um, lover of God, and you'll, you're going to get to see that in demonstration tonight. So we are also grateful for our, our partnership with Desert Springs, and I'm so grateful for the team um, of workers and people that have been here since 3 o'clock, Carl and his team. And, um, I also, also want to give a shout out to um, Al, Al Hurt, and he's he wanted to be here in the worst way, but he's with us in spirit. He sent me several texts today saying he's with us, so so pray, pray for Al and his recovery. We're also just grateful that we can be together tonight. We are also... If any of you ever want to join with us on Monday night for prayer, we do that as well. And tonight is, well, we, we're, we, Monday nights we prayer. Friday nights we also meet. This coming Friday night, because of the way the holiday falls, we're not going to meet. But we're going to meet on the 30th of December on Friday night in the, the choir room. The choir room. <laughs> that room. <laughs> so, anyway. It's been, at 7 on, on Friday nights. That's when we meet. We're also just blessed to have um, all of you with us. And we have Thomas Grenade, who's our, our minstrel. Um, and and so let's just, uh, I just want to pray as we, we open. Father God, we, we cry out to you tonight. We just pray that you would send your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. We thank you for your promise that wherever two or three are gathered in your name, that you're with us. And so we're grateful, Yeshua, that you're present with us tonight. Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you that you are the light of the world and that you came and you said, let there be light. And there was light. And this is the festival of lights, the festival of dedication. And Lord, we just thank you that we can once again dedicate 
our whole life to you, that you might be lifted up. Lord, we thank you for the peace of Jerusalem that you only can give. And so we pray for the peace of Jerusalem tonight. We also pray that we would be strong and be bold and be courageous, just as Joshua was. Lord, we thank you that we can choose this day that we'll serve you. Me and my house will serve you. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. And Lord, we just ask that you would bless our time together and just help us as we unfold your word so that it can be continually written on our heart, that we'd be transformed from one degree of glory to the next. Thank you, Lord, for tonight. We ask these things in, in Yeshua's name, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So they've lit in the, the, the Shamas candle, which is the servant candle, and depending on the Hanukkah, this is a Hanukkah that you use. Sometimes it's the lowest candle because the servant is willing to be served, serve. but it's also the, the highest candle because he, he is the light of the world. And we're not supposed to put our light under a bushel, but to, to light. So tonight's the first night, so we light the Shamas candle and the first candle. And then, so this is just practice for, we're going to see all of you every night this week, right? <laughs> <laughs> so this is just practice for the next seven nights. <laughs> Blessed are you, O God, ruler of the universe, who performs miracles for our ancestors in their days at this season. Baruch atadonai Eloheinu melech olam shechienu v'kiyamanu v'higiyanu lezman hazeh. Blessed are you, O, o God, ruler of the universe, for giving us life, for sustaining us, and for enabling us to reach this season. Amen. Amen. So, because we're going to have food, I'm going to say a blessing. Typically on, on Friday nights, we, we have a blessing for the bread from the earth and the fruit of the vine. And tonight, I'm just going to say the, the blessing for the bread from the earth, and then um, we're going to... Yeah, we're, we're going to form lines uh, and they're going to serve the food out there. So um, this is a challah. It's woven bread and it's just a traditional bread that Jewish people all over the world on this night, all over the world, there's Jews and we, Janet has family in Rio, in, in Jerusalem, in Sweden, and we, we've been blessed to be with them on different occasions. So. On these kind of nights, we think about family, literally across the miles. And I also just want you to think about the family that's here in the valley. Every, every day, I know I meet a Jewish person. It may be the same Jewish person that I met on that Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday, but there are between 30 and 40,000 Jewish people here. And really what they need to know is the love of Messiah. They need to see, the, see your light and to bring them love. And so our prayer is for that as well. So this is um, the Hala, and I'm going to say it in Hebrew, and then I'm going to say it in English. So this is 
crumbs. <laughs> Yeshua said he was the, the bread of life. And so this is bread. So, so if you want to say it with me, you can. Uh, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Hamotzi Lechem Mena Oretz. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And so you're going to, that's the, the blessing. Um, I don't, should I say the blessing for, we don't, we don't have any, I, I will say the blessing for the fruit of the vine, but it's similar. So if you come and join us on Friday night, we'll, we'll say that together. So I, they're ready. So we're ready to serve. Um, thanks. So we're going to go ahead. And I think what we should do is um, there's going to be two lines and plenty of servers. So why don't we start um, with, um, why don't we start with this table and then go back and then, but just pay attention to the lines and then we'll go. So we'll go. So Emily, go ahead and get started and Tom and, and Patty and then we'll just, um, maybe what we should do is start this way. We'll start, just go and start from, because the front to the back, because, so. Are you guys ready to do a little bit of singing? On a full stomach? You know, it's a, a wonderful thing to be in this family, the family of God. And when I was a young believer, I went to a church in the Northwest that had these two couples that were messianic, and I had no idea what that was. So I got to learn as a young believer about their love for Yeshua. Yeshua is Jesus. Can we say Yeshua together? Yeshua. And we know there is no other name in earth and in heaven by which men can be saved. Amen. Yeshua, Jesus. Something happens when we speak his name. You know, tonight we're going to have it's a wonderful adventure in discovering Yeshua in Hanukkah. And tonight we're going to start with a traditional song that comes directly from Psalm 133. And I'm going to read that to you. I know you're familiar. It's a short psalm. How good and how pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion. For there the Lord bestows his blessing even life forevermore and something happens when we come together like this i don't know about you but I, I love to worship at home i love to worship in my car but when we get together with our brothers and sisters in christ and we begin to sing and release our sound see i believe that we all have a different sonic impression a different sound Scripture says that his eyes saw our unformed body when we were made in the secret place. And you may think I'm crazy, but I think in that secret place he sang over each one of us. You ever wonder why some of us like jazz or classical or rap or rock or gospel, all the different types of music were so different because he sang his love song over each one of us. And that's why we can hear something and it reverberates with our spirit. Because we're going, oh, it's that deep calling unto deep. And so tonight, can we start by standing and singing this song? It's uh, the first one on your program, uh, on the left page, Hene Matov, In Unity. Shall the king 
dum ya. Let's try that again. You name my toku ma nai. Shabir kim dum ya ka. You name my toku ma nai. Shabir kim dum ya ka. You name my to. You name my to. La 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 la. So I, I, I know there's a few experienced Jerusalem solid gold dancers here somewhere in the room because I, I heard whoever brought the tambourine, thank you, because I needed a drummer tonight, so she's our drummer, and y'all are the choir, so you're the choir tonight. So, he named my toe, my name, Kim Gamaka. He named my toe, my name, Kim Gamaka. He named my toe, my name, Kim Gamaka. He named my toe, he named
church has been years and some of us never knew it. Tonight we're going to do a song. It's a beloved song. Many of you learned it in the mid-80s when Hosanna Integrity did a recording of this song. Let us exalt his name together. This was written by a wonderful messianic Yeshua loving rabbi. Stuart Dowerman. He's considered probably the father of messianic worship back in the 60s and early 70s along with a group called Lamb. I don't know if any of you remember their stuff, but phenomenal. And so, you know, we started off by doing a very common folk song and then we did Marty Getz's He Is My Defense. 
I don't know about you, but he is our defender. And that's tonight I felt you agreeing with heaven. Tonight, he is our defender. And so this song, Let Us Exalt His Name Together, it's an invitation. But it's so beautifully written. And what we do in the kingdom of God when a song is good, whether it's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 years old, 100 years old, we still do it. Because it's a good song. And this song here has become, for our little fellowship, it's every time I do it, it's I see people connecting. You know, my job as a worship leader is to lead you in his presence. And so I might have some tools up here, but that's all it is. The piano is just a tool. We love his presence. Don't we love his presence tonight? Don't we love to say his name, Jesus, Yeshua, Yahweh? Don't we love to do that? You know, on Friday nights, our group is small, but oh, I can tell you, it's so wonderful for me to sit and listen as people, all these voices are coming at me. Irene's... Where are you, Irene, tonight? She loves the Lord, and the worship just pours and spills out. And, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do bless your name, Yeshua. I know it's one of your favorites, but <laughs> I want to be sensitive at time. But, I, you know, I know this song you will connect with. It's a common. You'll go, oh, yeah, I remember that from the 80s. <laughs> the 80s were good years for worship. <laughs> His praise will be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. The humble man will hear him. The afflicted will be glad. So join with me to magnify.
Shalom. Um, we're going to have a time of, of sharing, and I don't know about you, but for me, this has just been such a blessing just to be together and to be in His presence. And so we, we have the pleasure of, of having uh, our dear friend, uh, Rochelle Perrault, share with us, and so she's going to share with you and with us. And I just pray that you just hear the words of, of her heart and our heart. So, um, it's noisy up here. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't feel like I'm lording it over you. <laughs> the last thing I want to do, I'd love to be in the middle of you, on the floor with you, but when you're five feet tall, <laughs> I have spent most of my life looking through the backs of people's heads, <laughs> and sometimes even their shoulders, and I don't want to do that to you. So that's my only reason for coming upstage, is not to upstage you. <laughs> and if you're uncomfortable, feel free to turn your chairs, get positioned where you are comfortable and you can enjoy, because uh, we don't want you with a crick in your neck going home or anything else. But uh, what a joy to have such a large mishpacha. We've got a great family. <laughs> and I just have to say again on behalf of Shema Yisrael, Desert Spring, we are so thankful. You have opened up your hearts, your home, your love, and we feel it. And honestly, that's not something Jewish people always experience in this world. <laughs> so, thank you. I feel the love, and I know it's not for me alone, but my all, all Shema wants to thank you and, and express our pre appreciation. And my understanding is that we may have some of you out there that don't know about Hanukkah. So I get to tell you all about it. And if you do know, just... I hope you'll enjoy. I should come up here with tradition from Fiddler on the Roof playing because it's all about tradition. <laughs> and uh, our tradition really, oh, even with me up here, we still have to move. Like I said, you know. But all you short people out there, dynamite comes in small packages. <laughs> So while they're getting that out of the way, I think that we can just go ahead and I will tell you, you're part of the tradition just by being here tonight. And this has been going on for about 2,000 years. That's a pretty old tradition. <laughs> but wait, as soon as I say to you Hanukkah, most of you are probably saying, well, what does that mean? And others of you are saying, just how do you spell Hanukkah? <laughs> and then there's the third part of the group that's saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, where is it in the Bible? I want to follow it in my Bible. So I've got to go back and I've got to explain to you to answer those questions and tell you exactly what our tradition is and what it means to us. And actually that us is all inclusive. What it means to all of you, whether you be Gentile, whether you be Jewish or whether you be, and my dad coined the word, a jew -tile. <laughs> That's someone who is part Jewish and part Gentile, and believe me, there's plenty of you out there. <laughs> Some of you may not even know it yet, but you may find that out. So let's answer those questions. Simply, Hanukkah means dedication. Now, I'll explain later what that has to do, but you will hear this called the Feast of Dedication, you will also hear it called the Festival of Lights. That's because lights are very important, but the actual meaning of the word you now know is dedication. And how many ways can we spell it and be right? <laughs> I have been told, I have not made the list, but I have been told that we can spell it 113 ways. And you're still right. <laughs> you heard Bruce earlier, the three Jews, the four opinions. Okay, <laughs> so when you're taking a language that does not have vowels and you're taking different sounds and you're trying to put it into English with vowels and with sounds, that's where you get all of your different spellings, but we are pretty uh, easy going. You can spell it how you like, we'll teach you how to say it, more importantly, we'll teach you what it means and then you can enjoy and appreciate it. So that answers two of my questions. The third one is going to be a jaw dropper because as soon as you who have asked, well, where is it in my scriptures? Where is it in my Bible? I have to tell you, it's not a biblically mandated holy day. So you're not going to find 
this is how to observe, like we do for our other seven major festivals or feast days or holy days that are all year long. And if you don't know those seven, I'm not going to tell you tonight. You have to come be with us on Friday nights for a year. Then you'll know our seven. <laughs> so come and enjoy that. But tonight is all about Hanukkah. And the reason why we celebrate it is because it is in the Bible, because it does have meaning to us, but it took place between the two testaments, the intertestamental period, which was about 400 years. For those of you that are used to the common way that it's referred to, you refer to an Old Testament and a New Testament. We like to refer to it as the original because it is where it originated and began and there's nothing old and antiquated about it. <laughs> and then our new is Brachadasha. That's the new covenant. And in the original, you are told about the new covenant. So you're beginning to get an idea that you don't have two books. And you're right. We don't. We have one continuous. It starts in Bereshit Genesis. It ends in the revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach, the revelation of Jesus the Messiah. And we flow through on a timeline of history in relation to Israel, the Jewish people, and God's ultimate plan. Now, I didn't leave you dear Gentiles out. We've got a great part that tells how you are grafted in but you're grafted in to the root, which is Yeshua. So you've got to come in and understand what we call Judeo-Christianity, Jewish Christianity, the bud being Judaism, the flower being Christianity. Now, if you can have a flower without a bud, then you can talk to God, because <laughs> God did it his way, and his way is the right way, the best way, and the only way. Amen. But let me tell you where it is mentioned in Scripture in case if you want to go home and look it up and see if I knew what I was talking about. <laughs> Yochanan is the Hebrew way to say John. So in your fourth book in the Brit Hadashah, John chapter 10 verses 22 and 23, and I'm going to read it to you from what is called the Complete Jewish Bible, which gives us our Jewish words in the, in the scripture so that you don't lose the Jewish flavor. Because if you see it through Jewish eyes, you understand a lot more. You get a background that helps you understand what they, they're doing and why they're doing it and what it's all referring to. So I read, then came Hanukkah. Now obviously in your scriptures, you've looked it up, you don't see the word Hanukkah, but you'll see the feast of dedication. And remember I told you that's what Hanukkah is. <laughs> So, then came Hanukkah in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem. It was winter. Okay, we know Hanukkah, we know winter, and we know Jerusalem, so we're all on the same page. And Yeshua, the Jewish way to say Jesus, which Thomas helped you know well, Yeshua what was, excuse me, was walking around inside the temple area in Shlomo's colonnade. Now, Shlomo is Solomon. In Solomon's temple, in the area of the colonnade, Yeshua was there on Hanukkah. Now, I don't know what you call your room here, but this is where you have your fellowships and your dinners and your celebrations. That's what the colonnade was. So basically, if Yeshua is walking around in the colonnade on Hanukkah, I don't think he was doing anything other than lighting a menorah and the other traditions that we have that go along with it. And he is going to use that backdrop and give it a whole new meaning. But that's getting ahead of it, so we've got to go back. <laughs> because as I said, this is a tradition that's 2,000 years old. Our Jewish people have celebrated Hanukkah every year without missing for, uh, since 164 B.C. So, if Yeshua celebrated it in the first century, I think we want to celebrate it in the 21st century. And tonight, you have begun to celebrate it. How many of you ate a latke for the first time? I had a feeling we'd have a few hands go up. <laughs> I hope you found it as yummy as I did, and we thank you, Sherman's Deli, for And she didn't tell me to put a plug in, I just did it. <laughs> there she is, I found her. <laughs> but I'll tell you, I'll put it this way. Welcome to our circle because about 79% of our Jewish brothers, and that's brothers and sisters, will eat latkes sometime during our eight days. They don't necessarily eat it every night, but if you love them, why not? <laughs> and some of us break the rules and eat them year-round. <laughs> 
Also, and we didn't get it out earlier, so I thought we were going to see some kids around playing dreidel and playing for Hanukkah gelt. Gelt is those little chocolate coins, it's chocolate money, and it's a fun game. And I was going to say, did you get some Hanukkah gelt? But I think I'd be told, no, most of you didn't, but that's okay because gelt is very closely related to the word guilt. <laughs> we Jewish people, we do guilt well, don't we, Janet? <laughs> So you might not want to play for the chocolate coins if your doctor or somebody would have something to say about that, but for our kids, it's tradition and it's fun and they do spin the dreidel. I think I'll tell you a little bit more about the dreidel when I get to that point in our history, but just remember the tops that you see, and I happen to bring one up here, it looks like a top, this is what's called the dreidel, this is what I'm talking about, and the Hanukkah gelt, the chocolate money. So you've got an idea of what it looks like, but we'll come back to that. We also have in front of you little menorahs, we lit the big one, and as you know, by day eight or night eight, we will have all eight of our holders lit. And if you count real quick, you're going to say, but wait a minute, Rochelle, there's nine on there. And if you look on your tables, there's nine on every. Actually, what those are called are Hanukkiahs, because they're specifically for Hanukkah. The reason for nine is because we're celebrating the eight days, and we have one that's always lifted a little higher than the others. It's called our Shamash candle, and we always use it to light the other candles. So it's not one of the days. It's the servant candle to light the others. I'll come back to that too. So surprisingly, there are more Israelis who light the candles in, in ratio than there are American Jews. <laughs> light your candles, Jewish people. We need to be doing it. <laughs> and that is surprising because I can take you in American history back to George Washington. George Washington recognized our American Jews and he said, and I quote him, May the children of the stock of Abraham who dwell in this land continue to merit and enjoy the goodwill of the other inhabitants, while everyone shall sit in safety under his own vine and fig tree, and there shall be none to make him afraid. Amen. Hmm. Seems like our boy George knew something about the Tanakh, the Hebrew scriptures, and God's promise to the Jewish race. And I would say as a sad note, but a hopeful note, may America always be a place of refuge for our Jewish people. Today is today. Hanukkah is a joyous holiday. We'll go around to each other, Hag Sameach, which is the joy of the day, celebrating Simcha, having joy, and it is a joyous time, but it is not a Jewish Christmas. <laughs> Remember, it's dedication. It's not a Jewish Christmas. Okay? So, dedication. Dedication to what? Or dedication of what? Exactly what does Hanukkah mean? And here's where I've got to go into history. And here's where I've got to watch my clock because <laughs> There's so much history to fit into a little period of time. Now, I can do it in three sentences. I can tell you they tried to kill us, we won, let's eat. <laughs> but if you go home with that, I don't think you're going to go home full and satisfied. At least I hope not. <laughs> So I can give you a little more and I can say the underdogs, the Jewish people, fought for and won their freedom from the huge Syrian army. That was miraculous. And another miracle happened also. And that's pretty well summing it up in just a couple of sentences too, but I've still lost over half my audience that doesn't know the background. So here we go. Okay. Let's go back to Alexander the Great. He has been over the what the entire known world he has died has been broken up in, by his four generals and you have the Seleucids in Syria in the north you have the Egyptians called the Ptolemies in the south and you have the land of Israel in between I think all of you know the map and so you know uh, that that's the relation and Israel had the misfortune of being pulled by whichever was stronger, the Seleucids or the Ptolemies, and it went back and forth and it was up and down. Some were more 
kindly toward the Jewish people, there were others who were less. By the time we come down in history to about 168 BC, this is ahead of what some know as the Maccabean Revolt, I'll explain that. But by the time you come down to this time, the Syrians are the ones that are stronger. The Greek influence is there. Alexander the Great brought the Greek influence into the world. He was very cultured. He brought the, the greatest library. We even have the Septuagint, the Greek form of the Hebrew scriptures during his time or right after his time. And through the Greek culture, his intent was to assimilate all the peoples, allow them a little bit of individuality, but bring them into a unity. Much as the Roman roads were to, all roads were to lead to Rome when Rome rose up, and the English language we have today is to be known worldwide so that people can be more united. Well, in Israel, there were those called the Hellenists who were more than willing to go along with those Greek ways. They were quick to, to assimilate into it, but then there were the traditionalists that wanted to be strictly with the Mosaic law. They wanted to follow their Jewish ways. So keep that in mind that that's internal, and now we've got the external, and we come down to the time that, Al, um, I'm sorry, Antiochus Epiphanes is in charge. He is uh, Syrian, he is up north. He called himself Antiochus Epiphanes. He actually was Antiochus IV. Epiphanes means God made manifest. Basically, he was calling himself a little God, and he pretty much acted like that too. I love the Jewish name for him instead. Very close, Epiphanes, which means the madman. <laughs> That's fitting. It absolutely fit his character. He embroiled in many wars, but specifically that what we're interested in is he went down into Egypt. Intent was to control Egypt, and then he would have Syria and obviously Israel and Egypt under his control. But during this time is when Rome is beginning to rise up and Rome's coming from the side and saying, uh-uh, we're not going to give you that much dominance. So Antiochus Epiphanes and the Roman Senate, I'll put it that way, came to a head and Antiochus was called out. He was basically told, you will not do this, and you will not take the booty that you had just picked up from Egypt. You will leave it, or you will have all of Rome come after you. What could he do? He knew that he couldn't fight against the Roman army at that point, so he turned around, left the booty, went through Israel on his way back home to, to the Syrian area, but he took his anger out on the Jewish people. Now, it wasn't just because of that. He didn't like the Jewish people anyway. His goal all along had been to defeat Israel's armies. He wanted to humiliate their God, and he wanted them to assimilate with him in the Greek ways. So it was nothing for him to add on to this now. And at this time, he put a halt to all of Judaism. You could not keep the Shabbat, the Sabbath. You could not circumcise your children. In fact, if you circumcised your baby, the father and the baby both would be put to death. He was not one to make threats, he was one to carry them out. He put the Syrian army into homes, literally forced the homes to host uh, soldiers. The soldiers then could be in control. Uh, they had renamed the cities, giving them Greek names. They made the study of the Torah, the law, the word of God prohibited. If you were caught with a scroll, again, execution was what you faced. And I could go on and on. That the worst is what he did in the temple. The temple was the holy place for the Jewish people. This was where God would meet them and where the presence of God dwelt. And he went into that temple, put up an idol to Zeus for everyone to worship his Greek god. He took a pig, non-kosher animal, slew, slay, slew it, killed it <laughs> on the altar, and then the, the broth that came with it, he sprinkled on all the holy books, oh. the scrolls, everything. He desecrated the entire temple. This was like breaking the heart of the Jewish soul because this was the most important place. And then he put up many altars all over and demanded that the Jewish people bow down, make sacrifices, worship the Greek gods, and again, nothing of the Jewish side at all. At this time, one by the name of Mattathias, who was a priest, and you did have the religious people try to fight back, 
but it's the joke that we used to say in my home. My dad was a minister, and we used to say that when it came to certain things, like fixing things around the house or, you know, different jobs, he'd make a great minister. <laughs> well, our Jewish priests made great priests, but they didn't make great warriors. Matthias was one of the highly respected. He was being forced one day by a soldier to bow down and make this sacrifice. Well, he wasn't going to do it. He was going to meet with his death. A Jewish man, thinking he was doing right, stood up and said, I'll do it for him. And that so enraged Mattathias that this one would even do it, even if he thought it was for, for himself. But he just was so enraged, in a fit of rage, he killed both the soldier and the Jewish person. And then he realized, now I'm in trouble. So he ran for the hills. His, his sons went with him. He had five sons. Judah Maccabee is one of the famous ones. Simon is another famous one. But others followed them also. And there were others that were already hiding in those hills because they were afraid of the Syrian soldiers. And in those hills, they kept their faith with their God. This is where our dreidels come in. The soldiers knew where some of the people were, and when they'd come to check on them, the people would hear the hoofbeats coming. They would quickly hide the few scrolls they had managed to keep that had not been destroyed by the Syrian army. They'd hide them, and they would bring out little clay tops, and they would act like they were playing a game, spinning the dreidel. And the soldiers would see that, would leave them alone. It looked like a gambling game because they had coins of some sort. When the Syrian army disappeared, out would come the scrolls. They'd sit all around. We're told that they learned to read Hebrew sideways and upside down because they were so intent on the word of God. It was so precious to them. They were right in the sense the one thing that absolutely was right is they were looking to their God. And they took and drew from Shemot, from Exodus 15, 11, the battle cry that is there, and I quote it for you, Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? In our Hebrew, it's Micha Mocha Ba'alim Yehovah. Now, if I took the first letter off of those four Hebrew words, you have the acronym for the word Maccabee. That was not Judah's last name. It was not Mattathias' last name. It means hammer from our Hebrew, and the intent was under this banner, we will hammer out the enemy. And because God saw their hearts, raised them up, he took a little renegade army. All they basically knew was, well, we have the lay of the land. We know how to trap the soldiers in certain areas where there's no way out. And they started their fight under the banner with their God. And because God is the same Amen. yesterday, today, and forever, look at David later with Goliath, the giant comes down, the Syrian army, that was earlier, pardon me, <laughs> it could be on the right side of history, but we see God brought down the Syrian army. They were able to push the Syrian army out of Jerusalem, Jerusalem, and the area, and eventually out of the land. But as soon as they had their, their capital, and by the way, Jerusalem has always been the capital of Israel, yeah. and it will be forever. Yeah. Just a political forgive <laughs> But as soon as they had that area, they didn't set about restoring their homes and setting up life for themselves. They went right to the temple, and they started cleansing it, purifying it as best they could. And the story is told that while they were cleaning it, they found a cruise of pure olive oil. And by the way, the olive oil that's used for the, the menorah that was to be in the temple, in fact, I'll tell you more about the olive oil later. Let me keep my story straight so I don't confuse you, but I'll come back to that olive oil. Anyway, they found a cruise that still had the priestly seal. It was considered pure still. There was always to be the light in the temple. They draw that from the Torah. I'll explain that in a bit, or I'll give you the reference in a bit. But uh, knowing it was to always be burning, even though this little bit would only last a day and it would take eight days to make the pure olive oil, they still wanted to show God, we want to do it right. We want to recognize you are always with us. And they lit the, the little bit of oil, and we are told the story miraculously happened that the oil didn't run out in a day, nor two days, nor three days, but it lasted all eight days. And that's how we get the Hanukkah for, uh, or the menorah, the Hanukkah menorah for Hanukkah. Now, 
We don't know if that's fact or not. I can tell you it's in our oral records from about 200 AD. It's in our written records from before 600 AD. It may be, and I have no trouble believing it because my God does miracles like that all the time. <laughs> so I have no trouble with it, but for those who don't, they still say that the reason why we're celebrating eight days is, again, you had your religious ones who wanted to be doing everything right before God. So the last holy day time that's recorded that the, one of the seven major feasts that they're supposed to keep was Sukkot. Sukkot is an eight day, um, I, I have a hard time calling it a festival, it's eight days long. And it's a time when they dwell in booths that they remember how God brought them out of Egypt. It's the ingathering. There's so much there. And so they decided, they say, that because they had missed a coat, they would keep this holy day because God had rescued them again like he did from Egypt. And they would keep it for eight days. We find that very much in our book of Maccabees, which are in the intertestamental time. They are not considered inerrant, inspired by God, but they are considered very accurate in historical data. And in 1 Maccabees, it tells, them, tells us they celebrated eight days, then Judah, one of the sons, and his brothers and the entire congregation of Israel decreed that the days of rededication should be observed every year for eight days. And in the second book of Maccabees, they said, quote, the Jews celebrated joyfully for eight days as on the Feast of Booths. Feast of Booths is another name for Sukkot in, in our English. So whichever way, eight days were decreed from the very beginning, and we celebrate. And whether we're celebrating exactly on target, overall we know we are celebrating. It was miraculous. The little Israeli army against the greatest army in the world at that time, a few hundred probably, maybe up to a thousand, maybe against thousands. It's God. It's God. There's no other way to put it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And they drew from the scriptures for the celebration, reading from the Psalms, reading from Zechariah chapter 5 and verse 6, Zechariah, which says it's not by my might, nor by my power, yes. but by the Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. They brought the menorahs into the homes, but they didn't use them in the homes for light. In fact, to this day, in the Orthodox tradition, women are not allowed to do any kind of work by those candles. That's not their intent. And originally, they put them in the uh, door, what do you call it? You know, like the, the doorway, the door... The threshold, thank you. That's the word I want. In the threshold, Sometimes they had to put it in a window because they couldn't have it in the outside and keep the lights burning. But they were to be on the outside because they were to proclaim to the world the light of Hanukkah. That's going to have a lot more meaning as we go on. But that's why by the time Josephus is recording for us, and he was a Roman historian, Jewish background, who, who was just recording history for the Roman people, he called Hanukkah the festival of lights because you would see where all the Jewish homes were, all of these lights on the outside lighting continually. I think I've done, have I done all the history? Did I leave anything out? The olive oil. The olive oil. I'll come back to the olive oil. I'll, I'll get you that part. <laughs> um, let me tell you about the family celebrating because this is right down to us today. The family gathers around the Hanukkah every night at sundown, uses that shamash candle to light either tonight, one night, those will burn all the way down. Tomorrow night, it'll be a new shamash candle and two candles put in the menorah. That will burn all the way down and they continue it all eight nights. While the lights are burning, the kids are singing fun songs. We tried to get them up tonight, next year. There's always a reason for next year. <laughs> They sing fun songs, they sing songs, I have a little dreidel, they sing songs that tell the story. The fathers especially tell the children the history because when you repeat again and again and again it becomes ingrained and it's a part of them. And then when they've grown up and they start their home, they're able to carry it on with their children. And that's very important because we're to teach our generations, we're to carry it on. And the menorah came to be known as the nightlight of the Jewish people. I like that. <laughs> it's our nightlight. 
But it's interesting in Judaism, the menorah is a symbol of light, but it's specifically, it's supposed to be the symbol of the light of God and the light of the Torah, God's word. And they are to faithfully follow the biblical mandate of bringing the light of God into every generation and into every home. So as we carry on, even in our Hanukkah traditions, our Hanukkah traditions, we are carrying on the light of God and birthing that, kindling that in the hearts of our children. So it's a fun time. They sing the songs, they play the dreidel, they play for the chocolate coins. Mama's pit making the latkes. And someone asked me, why jelly-filled donuts? <laughs> the donuts are fried in oil. That's the whole purpose. Now, somewhere along the line, somebody decided the donut was boring. <laughs> they shot in the jelly to make it a little more enjoyable. And now it's tradition. <laughs> I have to say, hmm, we didn't want it to look like the bagel, so we filled the hole. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> uh, now I think I've told you everything, our history and all, and, and we've got our tummies filled, don't we? We've had a great time. We're, our uh, heads are full of, of historical facts. But I've got to ask you that question that I started with earlier. What's the relevance to us today? Why do we stop? Why take time? Why celebrate for eight nights? Why would you Gentiles want to be a part of this? Why? 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 A very good Jewish question. <laughs> we love to ask questions. And I'll tell you, if you feed a man a fish, you fed him for a day. You all know the saying? But if you teach him to fish, and the women say, we get to get rid of our husbands for a weekend. <laughs> but the truth of it is, then you feed them for a lifetime. And if I've taught you one episode in Jewish history, and that's all I've given you tonight, is one episode where they tried to kill us, because I can take you through the entire Jewish timeline. And because we have an enemy. He actually is the enemy of our God. And he wants to destroy God's plan, and he wants to subvert the Mashiach, the Messiah, to him. Never. He doesn't have a hope. I could use a few other words, but I'll be kind. <laughs> Why do I tell you just this one? Because if that's all I've done, really, I haven't given you anything that matters, especially if you're not Jewish. And even for our Jewish people, they can say, well, we'll just skip over that episode. We don't want to remember all the tragedies. We want to remember the good times, but we need to remember because there's one key element in Hanukkah that we have to address, and that is the light. And I've entitled my message tonight, Even the Light That Never Burned Out, and it never will burn out. Let me tell you about this light because it had almost gone out. It was almost extinguished. Throughout time, there are many times we can see where it really dwindled down, but it never burned out. As I mentioned, we've got a, a timeline that we are told through the scriptures, and you can look in the scriptures alone, starting in Genesis, and you will see how the enemy came against our people and tried to, to bring that light out. As dear Gentiles, I encourage you, Study the original scriptures. It's the foundation of everything you're believing now. Yes, it's yes. the beginning. It gives you so much more understanding and you see the whole picture. So, dear Gentiles, don't leave out the original. And to my dear Jewish people, don't be afraid to go to the Brachat Shah. As soon as you open it up and look at the first chapter, you take a peek and you'll find out it's written by a Jewish boy. <laughs> and it's all about my ancestors. It's talking about my great, 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 great granddaddies. <laughs> what are they doing on that side that's supposed to be the, quote, Christian side? And I'll tell you, it's on the right side because there's only one side, and it's the continuation of the story. So please take a peek, and you'll find every book is written by a Jewish person, and you'll find that everything that's taught has its basis in that original, and in the original, what may have been concealed is now revealed, and you get the greater picture, and you get the final chapter, Israel. 
in the Baruch HaDashah, in the book of Revelation, that book that is to reveal Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, our Messiah. And it tells us, and I love it, sorry that I am Jewish, we win. <laughs> and when I say we win, that means our Messiah comes back. And he sits on an earthly throne. He fulfills his promise, quoted in 2 Shmuel chapter 7. You can look it up later. Start with about verse 16, maybe a little earlier. He promised to sit on David's throne, that David would always have that throne filled, and it would be filled by Messiah. And he brings that shalom to the entire land that has been promised to our Jewish people. And every promise that has not been fulfilled yet finds its fulfillment then. And once again, are yet Gentiles left out? No, not for a moment, because Israel will finally do what God had planned. They will be the light to the nations, and the nations will come into Israel, literally to the temple, see Messiah on the throne, bring their, their gifts to him, and go back home and be blessed in their land, because God loves all. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So, I've got to tell you, though, we've got to follow the light. We've got to see the light. So I'm going to take quick jumps. I'm going to take you back to Shemot, to Exodus chapter 27, verses 20 and 21, repeated in Viagra, Leviticus chapter 24, verses 2 to 4. In that, you have the lamp in the tabernacle. That's the holy place, and this lamp was to burn continually. This is the menorah that you see, the seven branch one middle that feeds the other six. And it's a beautiful picture from Messiah also, but that's a lesson for another day. The light, though, is to burn, is to burn continually, and it is to be used, or lit, or filled, or however I should say that, with the pure olive oil. That's where now, let me tell you, pure olive oil is not the oil that, when the olives are being crushed, that comes out. It's the oil that has been beaten. In the beating, they've taken out all the leaves and the twigs and the dust from the olives that would be mixed in in the other. And they get a pure oil. And it is, in color, white. I'll just let your minds go with that one because, again, I've got to stay on track or I'll be... <laughs> I will have you here till midnight, and I promise not to do that. But in my father's Orthodox traditions, the Shamish candle always was white, pure and white. It's called the Shamish. It means servant, pure, white, sinless, you could say, servant, and it's going to light the others. And if I could take a whole nother hour tonight, I could take you through each day. And each day is a picture in relation to our Mashiach that is beautifully portrayed through the Hanukkah. Mm. We've got so much to share with you. Following the light, Shemot, Exodus, Leviticus, I'm going to leap into our prophets. I'm going to take you to Yeshaya, uh, Isaiah. I said it good enough for now. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, and I will read them to you. But there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. In earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali with contempt, regarded it lightly. But later on, he shall make it glorious by way of the sea on the other side of the Jordan, which is the Jordan, Galil of the Goyim, that's Galilee of the Gentiles. Verse 2. The people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. Now, Isaiah, for us, we know is history. But at the same time, Isaiah spoke prophetically. He foretold what was going to happen to Israel very soon. They were looking to go into captivity. This is a time of gloom. Exactly what it said in the start of the verse. There will be no more gloom, but right now that meant there is gloom. It was a time of calamity. It was a time that the wicked king Ahaz was going to continue to be dishonorable toward God and lead the people wrong, and they were going to go into that time of captivity. It was a time of dread. It was a time of the fear of the foreign invasion. They knew that they were about to be victims. The conquest would be there. And in that midst, and you can imagine the heavy weight they're feeling, in the midst of that darkness, suddenly, Yeshua, Isaiah, boom, 
he speaks of a great light. What a contrast to that darkness. And he breaks forth with this burst of this glorious vision. It was as sudden as the sun suddenly rising in the midst of that dark night. We're looking at the pall of death. We're looking at the shadow that caused, that, that, the shadow that comes from it. I used the wrong word, I'm sorry. Cast, it was cast, that's what I'm trying to say. And in the midst of that, all of a sudden, he's speaking about this great light. And that makes us think also, tell Lean Psalm 23, 4, which speaks about a great light that's to come to our people. And because I have to hurry, I'm going to take another leap. I'm going to come down in the Brit Hadashah, in the first book, as I already told you, written by a good Jewish boy, and I'm going to read you chapter 4 of what you call Matthew, Matthew. This was to fulfill, and I'm quoting him right now, chapter 4, starting with verse, I'm going to start with verse 16, but read 14 to 17 on your own. This was to fulfill what was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. Quote, The land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who were sitting in darkness saw a great light. And those who were sitting in the land in the shadow of death, upon them a light dawned. Now doesn't that sound like Isaiah? It's almost word for word. You see why I say it's not two separate books and two separate people? This is the same book. This is one book. Before I explain Matthew, let me take one quick look back at another chapter in Isaiah. Chapter 60 in verses 1 through 3 because it sheds a little more light on the light. It says, Arise, shine, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, for your light has come. The glory of Adonai has risen over you. For although darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness the peoples, on you, Adonai, will rise. Over you will be seen his glory. Nations will go toward your light, and kings toward your shining splendor. And do you see how suddenly in chapter 60, that light has now been personified? That light is not just a light. Now that light is a person. That person has a name. Isaiah has identified him as Adonai. And when you're in darkness, you're going to see the light of Adonai. Later, we're going to see, and I mentioned it already, in that millennial time, you'll see the nations and you'll see the kings come toward that light and benefit from the blessings in it. But before that time, before we get to that end, we've got Matthew 4. And what we have happening in Matthew 4 is the fulfillment of the person bringing that light into Israel's darkness. See, they were sitting in a dark night. And suddenly, there is the light. Upon them, the light dawned. What light dawned? What are we talking about? What's Matthew trying to tell us? Well, remember, they know if they're studying their prophets, they should be looking for a person. And suddenly, in the midst of darkness, in the midst of another time when Rome is ruling over and they are afraid of their future, it is another dot time of calamity and darkness. And suddenly, on the scene, is this one we call Yeshua, Jesus. And I will quote you exactly what he said, because Matthew records it for us. Yeshua spoke to them again, quote, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light which gives life. And wow, to the Jewish mind, clap, it's for the Lord, I'll read it. Every bell, every whistle, every light in the Jewish mind should have gone off as soon as he spoke those words. Mm -hmm. It's the fulfillment of what Yeshua, Isaiah had said. And now it's being spoken in the fullness of a person. One who is in the shape of a body. One who has taken on the form of a human. But one who we know is God, is Adonai, is the Lord come in human form. He, we are told in another book called Hebrews, written to our Hebrews by a Hebrew, that he is the express image of God himself. Mm -hmm. Yeshia, Isaiah, I love him. We're all over him. Chapter 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born, 
Adonai, Jehovah God, in Adonai the Son, slipped into time and space, put on a face, had a body. We call him Yeshua, Jesus. Mm -hmm. The child is born, but the Son is yeah. given because the Son was never born. Because in the beginning, the Son with the Father created the heavens <coughs> and the earth. Yeah, but man. this is the embodiment. This is the fulfillment. This is where it becomes a person. And Yeshua is pointing the way to Elohim. He's pointing the way to the Jewish God, the one true and living God, the one that Antiochus Epiphanes did not want them to worship, the one that he claimed he was going to humiliate him. He was going to do away with him, and here he comes shining in all his glory and an even greater glory to be seen. But here is Yeshua who is saying, I've come to do the will of the Father. I've been sent by the Father, and we know that somehow in a way we cannot understand. It wasn't just the Father sending, it was the Son who is the Father who came <coughs> into the world for us, and we have our 100% human and 100% divine in one God. <laughs> and he says, when he's fulfilling the will of the Father, he is being led by the Spirit, by the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. There is our triune God, given to us all the way back in our original scriptures also, because when God refers to himself, he re uses the word Echad, a united God, a God who can be divided into three personages, but who is one God. He doesn't use the singular word Yachid that cannot be divided, and here Yeshua is claiming it. I am God. I am the son that was given. And by the way, that word given, the root is gift. I am the son gifted. Isn't he the greatest gift? You want the greatest presence? It's the presence of the greatest God Amen. in this body of Yeshua, Amen. Jesus. That's who he is and who he was <laughs> claiming. And quite possibly, when Yeshua declared to a Jewish audience, I am the light of the world, it very likely could have been near the time of the Feast of Dedication. Amen. If it was not, it probably was near the time of Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles that I told you they may have drawn some of their traditions off of because we do see a pattern between Hanukkah and Sukkot. And either time at Sukkot in the court of the women, and the Temple Mount is up high, remember Jerusalem's down below, in the court of the women, they raised that four 75-foot tall menorahs. Yeah. Now, I had trouble reaching this one. <laughs> they must have had good ladders. <laughs> because somehow, 75 feet high, they would light four menorahs that would burn all night. All of the rich line could see their light. At the Feast of Dedication, there was at least one of those 75-foot candelabras burning all night. Whichever time it was, I can see Yeshua pointing, I am the light of the world. This is what he came to do, was to bring in the darkness of the night, the brightness of the light. This is the one who said that he would bring the people out of darkness and into the light of life. And when I hear those words in Isaiah, suddenly Yochanan, and by the way, John is Jewish too. Y'all, when you say John the Baptist and you make him a good Gentile, are doing him such a disservice. <laughs> He's Yochanan the Immerser. <laughs> He's as Jewish as they come. <laughs> and he declared in chapter 1, opening his book, and he is the one who speaks so much of the love of our God, but he says, in the beginning, I can stop right there and say, every Jewish mind, come with me back to Bereshit. In the beginning, a very good place to start. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. There's the connection, and yet he goes on in verse 4, says that the light that came into the world, and let me quote it so I don't say it wrong, in him was life, and the life was the light of mankind. Genesis 1-3 tells us that God said, let there be light, and there was light. Now here's one who said, I came to be, in him was life, and life was the light of mankind. Light gives life. 
Amen. Whether we're talking physical or whether we're talking the greater spiritual. And we all know that's what we're referring to right now. And then with all of this in your mind now, and you're beginning to think like good Jewish boys and girls, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> Let me take you to verse chapter 8 and verse 12. If this doesn't bring it home, nothing will. Because this Yeshua is speaking again. And he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light which gives life. I can put a period on the end of my sentence. Ding, 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 ding. We've got it. It's here. It's all seen. It is so clear. Yohanan John 1 verse 9 says, This was the true light which enlightens every man. And Psalm Tehillim 27 1 says, Adonai, is my light and my salvation. And my heart just rejoices because Yeshua didn't just bring the light. Yeshua is the light of the world. And when you bring him in, all darkness flees. The darkness must flee. The light is what rules. Chapter 12, staying with Yochanan, our good Jewish boy. Chapter 12 and verse 46, I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. He didn't give them any chance to misunderstand Yeshia. He spelled it out. The light that would come when they were sitting in darkness is personified in chapter 60. Here he is. He's called Adonai in chapter 60, and here he is called Yeshua, and he's quoting chapter 60 and the earlier that we, we all the scriptures that we have been given. This is the story of Hanukkah, the light of the world. This is the eternal triumph of God's light over darkness. Chapter 60, verse 20 of, Yis of Isaiah, for Adonai will be your light. What's your favorite word, Janet? Forever. Forever. <laughs> the light that never went out. It's forever. It is eternal. And again, he says he's the light of our salvation. Isaiah 49, 6, God said he would make her a light to the nation so that his salvation may reach the ends of the earth. When Yeshua brings that light into Israel, when he is the light of Israel, when we see him in this fulfillment, we know that that's the light that will go out and bless those nations that come into faith believing. That's how a Gentile comes in, is grafted into our Jewish fruits and benefits from the light because Yeshua, Yehovah, whichever you're referring to, the Father, the Son, never left out the dear Gentiles either. We are all to be blessed and we are all to have it brought to us. Any who will receive, they are given the light. They are given the life. If we've embraced our Messiah, and I hope everyone in this room has, then I will tell you, you should be a torchbearer. You should be one who is carrying this light to the others on the outside. That's what Matthew also tells us, that good Jewish boy in the British Chodeshah, he says in chapter 5 and verse 16, let your light so shine that, we glor that it will glorify our Father who is in heaven. Kepha, Peter, he tells us that we're to be the priests like the nation of Israel was to be and one day will be. Right now we are to be those priests carrying the light to the world that is sitting in darkness. Does anyone doubt that this world is in darkness and in need of the light? This is where we should be. And I'll bring you an example that absolutely just brings this home. About the, the beginning of the 20th century, there was a real... Uh, zeal that went forth and many went out they were called missionaries they went to take the light to an area that did not have the light among them was one called Peter Milne by name now these people got a nickname they were called the one-way missionaries and some of you might say oh well one way and we know that to be true but no that's not why they were called one-way missionaries the reason why they were called that is they would take their possessions that they felt they needed for where they were going and they would package them all in a coffin. That's what they traveled with. They didn't travel with a suitcase, they didn't travel with whatever luggage. Their luggage was a coffin because they were never going to come back. 
and they would go and they would set up and they would share about the light and when their life was over here was the coffin that they were to be buried in so they were one-way missionaries because they were never going to come back home Peter Milne chose to be a missionary to the knee hybrids new hybrids sorry new hybrids <laughs> New Hebrides. I can't talk tonight. <laughs> words. Anyway, it was an area that others who had gone before had all been killed. They did not listen to them. They had actually martyred all the ones that had gone before. But God put on Peter's heart to go. And through his love for this people, he was able to bring the light. And when he finally passed away, it was, I think he spent almost 50 years on his mission field and when he finally did they buried him in his coffin and they knew he brides people lovingly put up a sign on his tombstone and it said when he came there was no light when he left there was no darkness that's the light that I'm offering you this is what Hanukkah means the dedication and I'm sure I even made it clear they rededicated their temple to the Lord on the 25th of Kislev. That's what we celebrate for our first night. It was the rededication of the temple, and some say it was exactly three years after the destruction of the temple. I don't know if that's true or not, but I find that highly significant also. But the, ded the dedication was of the temple, and us is the dedication of what that temple is representing. Remember, the temple represented Elohim to the people. It's where they met God, where his presence would dwell among them. And through Hanukkah, through the light, we have that chance. God says that our bodies become a temple when the light comes with it. And we meet our God, and we are dedicated to our God to spread that light. And I will tell you, if you plug into the light of the world, you will know no power failure. The light will never go out. And that's the significance of our Hanukkah. Rekindle yourself to the light, or let the light be kindled in your heart for the first time. Whichever way it is, it's the greatest gift you can ever give yourself. It is the presence of the Ruch HaKosh, the Holy Spirit of our God, Elohim Ha'im, the Most High God of our Father, who personified himself in the Son who took on that human form that he might redeem humankind. What a story. Yeah. What a light. The darkness is flee, And we have the light of the world, Yeshua Jesus. Let's close in prayer. We come to you <clears throat> with praise and thanksgiving, Yeshua Jesus. We thank you for bringing the light into the world in a personal way, for fulfilling our prophet Isaiah, and for declaring to all that you are the eternal light that will burn forever. Lord, we pray for those who are in this room tonight, if there be any among us who have not opened their heart to that light, we pray that even at this very moment, in the quietness of their heart, may they say yes. I want the light of the Father through the Son brought into my heart. I believe, Yeshua Jesus, you came to earth, died on that cross, raised from the dead. You are alive forevermore that your death could be in my place and I can be in that place to live in the light of heaven forever one day. Any who want this, Lord, may they just cry out in their hearts right now, yes, yes, bring the light into my life. And we thank you that you are the light of life, that you will birth new life into that person, and we pray that they will be brave enough to share it with someone in this room, that we can help them know the path that they are now on to know you and one day live with you forever. And for all us who are believers, Lord, our hearts shout out, hallelujah, praise to our God. We thank you, and we do rededicate our lives to the light. Let us be bright torch bearers. Let us be one-way missionaries. Let us spend out our days taking the light to those who are sitting in darkness. And how we praise you and thank you that you brought the light into the world. Oh, hallelujah. What a time to celebrate. You came into this world that you might pave the way that we can leave this world and come into your world forever. Where you are the lamp and the light of it forever. Thank you. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus our Messiah. Amen. 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 Amen.